we'll talk about heaven and hell a little bit here this morning. Father, we ask your blessing on our study this morning. We pray that you would, uh, by it, enable it, us to have our minds set on things above and not be so focused on things here that are, that are temporal. And uh, we pray, Father, that you would uh, watch over those this morning that are ill, that you would encourage them and uh, restore them to health. And we pray all of these things in Christ's name. Amen. All righty. Well, <clears throat> yeah, I put the scripture up on the screen here. Um, those of you watching online won't be able to see it because, well, we just don't have the YOLO hooked up that way here. No, but, but anyway, you, you can resort to um, the archaic method of opening a print Bible. So... And, or on your iPhone anyway, so uh, biggest advantage there is, uh, you know, there's advantages and disadvantages, isn't there? Um, when you read your print Bible and underline and so forth, it's easier over time to remember where a certain passage is. When you use the computer Bible or the Bible on your iPhone, every page looks the same, and, and uh, so that... That is a bit of a, of a, of a problem. So, so it's, it's not true as the, as the line in, what, what was that? Oh, that's in Ghostbusters, you know. The Egon says, print is dead. You know, he, he's working on a computer, and he, oh, print is dead. Well, it's not, it's not quite dead anyway, so. Um, but, all right, well, um, we're at chapter two here. The title is, is heaven beyond our imagination. What I'm going to try to do, and that's why I put this scripture up on the screen here, is that uh, I want to uh, basically, in these chapters, as I read them, I, I circle sections where he, particularly where he's referring to a, a biblical passage. And, uh, and that's what I'll focus on, and we'll, we'll see what what the scripture says, and so in, in the meantime, through the week, you can be reading uh, the book. Now, there's a couple of uh, caveats here. It's been quite a few years since I read this book, and I just remembered it being uh, really good, which in many ways it is, and I, I don't know whether they, he updated, added some material, or maybe it's just because I've... Uh, uh, wised up doctrinally a lot more since I read it through the, the first time. But as we mentioned last time, there are some problems that, you know, and you, so you always have to be on your toes when you're, when you're reading. Uh, I suppose even if you're reading John Calvin, but, you know, you don't have to be, you know, he, he, generally, he generally gets it right. So, um, but... Uh, you know, last time I pointed out that, to be cautious, that page 27, where he quoted from that um, uh, mystic Roman Catholic gal, right? And we thought, that, that is pretty weird, you know, why, why did you put that in the book? Well, uh, as I found out, or had it pointed out to me this last week, um, that's not the last time that he does that in this book. If you look at the back of the book, there's a there's several indexes, but one of them is on page 519, a name index, right? A name index, and uh, you know, so when you get that, if you come on down in the, it's alphabetical, so you just come on down a little ways into the B section. Uh, he he cites a, a father, J. Boudreaux, I guess is how you pronounce it, Boudreaux, J. Boudreaux. And you can see there the page references. He cites that guy one, two, three, four, five, six, seven times. Now, um, Boudreaux was a Roman Catholic priest. He was a Jesuit. And he wrote a book called The Happiness of Heaven. And uh, it just seems to me problematical that Alcorn is so <laughs> enamored 
with, with that book. Because see, here's the danger. Here's the danger. Even uh, Calvin and the reformers pointed this out. You know, we're, it's like, we're always being accused of being too judgmental, too nitpicky, and too critical, and so forth. But, um, but we need to be, and we need to be very biblically discerning whenever we're reading something. Here's the problem. When somebody like Alcorn, writing this book, keeps quoting these, a Roman Catholic priest or nun or so forth, undiscerning people, people are going to read that, and what are they going to, what's it going to lead them to think? Exactly. I mean, they're going to be more open to it. Well, you know, it has its differences, but then they believe in the Trinity and the deity of Jesus and the, these kind of things so that it, so it's okay. And so this is, it was like, either I was oblivious when I read the book the first time a long time ago, or, or it's been added. Here's a, let's see, this is off of, uh, this is off of Amazon and it's the back cover, I looked up the back cover of his book, The Happiness of Heaven, The Joys and Rewards of Eternal Glory. And he starts off quoting 1 Corinthians here, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man what things God has prepared for them that love him. Thus does St. Paul speak of the splendor of heaven. Further, Paul tells us that the sufferings of this time are not worthy to be compared with the glory to come that shall be revealed in us. That's Romans 8. And here it is, and he's citing that same gal. And St. Teresa of Avila states that she would rather suffer all the afflictions of this world even to the end of time if she could thereby merit a little more glory in heaven that she might thereby understand a little more of the greatness of God and therefore love him and praise him the more. Now, right there, hidden, right in that statement is the false gospel of Rome. She says, I would rather suffer all the afflictions of this world if I could thereby merit a little more glory in heaven. See, that's what purgatory is all about, all of that false doctrine. Uh, and then the commentator goes on, the happiness of heaven explains that a high degree of glory in heaven is within the reach of all baptized souls. Now there's a problem. It's within the reach of all baptized souls. Rome teaches that baptism justifies you before God. Now, real quick, the first time you sin, you lose it, and then you got to work, 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 work to, to, to gain it back. But nevertheless, you see it here. The greatest and happiest in heaven will be those who led the holiest lives on earth. Well, wait a minute. That's works. That's works, you see. Um, the, um, what is this here? not necessarily those who in this world possess the greater in intelligence, talent, beauty, or education. In heaven, no one can look upon the glorious side of God without great joy and without becoming godlike and beautiful himself. Thus, a soul in heaven is filled to overflowing with all knowledge. It becomes beautiful with the beauty of God, rich with his wealth, holy with his holiness, and happy with his unutterable happiness. The more completely we've mortified our inordinate passions and made our life conformable to that of Jesus Christ. See, you, you make your life more conformable, see. Uh, the more also of personal beauty and splendor uh, of the soul we shall possess in heaven. And, uh, and so there it is. So why is Randy Alcorn quoting from these sources, you see? And, and you can be just guaranteed that the average professing Christian is going to just read this stuff. And uh, so I don't know. It, he's written like 40 books. 
including novels. And uh, he's, some of his stuff has been like a New York Times bestseller stuff. That's dangerous. That's dangerous because you can end up drifting and, uh, you know, well, you know, I don't want to be too critical of Roman Catholicism because that'll maybe alienate a lot more, you know, that sort of a thing. So it, it is a problem. That's a, that's a big problem um, in this book. There's another problem as well uh, that I've, I've seen. I've just read up through like the fifth chapter or so, or so forth, but um, the, uh, in, in, the fourth, in the fourth chapter, I guess I've read up through the fifth chapter, but the fourth chapter is basically what he does is, uh, it's entitled, Can You Know You're Going to Heaven? And, uh, of course, concludes that, that uh, the Bible tells us you can know. Uh, but I wrote in the top here, and this is a very weak chapter. Because what he's doing here is this is his chapter on presenting the gospel to people who would be reading the book and maybe they're not Christians, right? So he's presenting the gospel to them, which that's a, that's a, a, good, thing, a good thing to do. Um, the problem is he gets his pronouns all messed up. No, we're not talking about the, the current woke craze on pronouns. We have to be really careful when we're using pronouns, particularly first person plural pronouns. Okay, you know what first person, first person is I, you know, second person is you, third person is he or she. All right, so first person is I, but the plural of I is what? We, all right. Well, when you start writing and are presenting the gospel and talking about Christ's death on the cross and so forth, and you are carelessly using first-person plural pronouns, we, us, this kinds of things, uh, without specifically defining what, well, who are you talking about, Randy? Who... Who, when you say we, when you say Christ atoned for us on the cross, who, who's the us, right? Are you, are you talking about the elect? Are you talking about believers? Or are you talking about the whole world? And what he does, actually, his presentation of the gospel is an Arminian presentation, and you'll, you'll see that if you haven't read the chapter, but you'll see it when you do, when you do read it. It's an Arminian presentation. Um, so, for example, he says, Throughout the ages, countless people have been too busy to respond to Christ's invitation. Um, many assume they've done good, ch attending church, being baptized, singing in the choir, and it's enough to gain entry to heaven. But people who do not respond to Christ's invitation to forgive their sins uh, don't have their names written in the Lamb's book of, of life. Um, then he asks, have you said yes to Christ's invitation to join him at the wedding feast and spend eternity with him in his house? Well, you see there, have you said yes? Now, to his invitation. First of all, Christ doesn't invite, he commands. This is a command. The gospel is a command, all right? And uh, when he says, come to me, he, he, it, 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 it's a command and uh, uh, not, not an, an invitation. But also, he does not deal here with the issue the, the condition of the sinner. He doesn't deal with the fact that the sinner is dead in his sins. All right? In other words, he doesn't deal with total depravity. He, I, I would say that Alcorn in his theology is kind of like Billy Graham. Um, he is, and, and he, should, he should know better, but he is, uh, he is um, uh, what would, what did, uh, R.C. Sproul categorized semi-Pelagian or 
something like that, you know. Or maybe he would say, well, I'm a 3.5 point Calvinist, or he was just real common, you know, that kind of a thing. But his presentation, first of all, so he's not dealing with the T in Tula, total depravity. All right, have you said yes to Christ's invitation? Well, okay, in itself, that's not a terrible statement, but it's not qualified. It's like you need to tell, look it, we are, let, let's start back here. We are dead in our sins. We're dead. We are dead to God. We have no, we have no desire for God. Our will is in bondage to Satan. We cannot believe in Christ because we will not believe in Christ. Okay, that's the condition. And therefore, what has to happen is God, who is the author of salvation, God has to, by his word and spirit, regenerate our heart and give us the gift of faith, whereby we believe. And if you've been following the Ephesians study uh, through the week, We've been dealing with that in the second chapter. But so what he should be saying is, so what you've got to do is the best sinner's prayer that was ever heard, right, is God be merciful to me, a sinner. That's what you tell people. God be merciful to me. And you can encourage him and say, if you will pray that prayer genuinely and humbly and, and mean it, that you recognize, you know, you're not even daring to look up to heaven, but, but God be merciful to me, a sinner, or I am lost. Then God's promise is, whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Whoever, there, there's the promise. But see, Alcorn doesn't do that. He's, he's presenting the gospel as if, people and assuring them basically that um, they have the ability to choose that depends on them. That's not Reformed theology. That's not Calvin, Calvinistic doctrine. And uh, so anyway, um, so, so through, all through the chapter, you'll see this Arminianism. Uh, on the cross, Jesus experienced the hell we deserve so that for eternity... We can experience the heaven we don't deserve. Now, you can tell he, he's a writer, popular writer, and he's got a good turn of words there and so forth. But, but again, who's the we? Jesus experienced the hell we deserve on the cross. So what he's saying there is that um, the atonement was universal, that Christ died for the sins of everybody. And now it's up to you to choose Christ. Okay, there, there then is the uh, is is the offer. So, but Christ, Christ, and, and this is why uh, I say Alcorn is probably like a three point five, three and a half point Calvinist. Um, they he won't necessarily like total depravity apparently, so that reduces you to four points. Um, Let's see. He's probably okay on unconditional election. Um, it's going to waffle on irresistible grace because there again, it's like it's up to me. I have the, I have the ability to not choose Christ no, mat, no matter what. All right. But the one big hang-up that, that really um, is objectionable to, to people is the L. Limited atonement, or better, definite atonement. That is, Christ died effectually for the elect on the cross. And all you got to do is read Christ's high priestly prayer in John 17, and you'll see that. Father, I do not pray for everybody. I do not pray for it, but, I, but those you have given me. He says that over and over. Those you have given me. Those you have given me. So he effectually atoned for the sins of the elect, of his, of his people on, on the cross. That's another reason we can be encouraged when we're sharing the gospel, because when one of his, one of his people 
hears, hears the gospel. They hear Christ's voice and they, they're going to respond then, uh, you see, at, at, uh, at some point. But that's where it's, I mean, people professing Christians, a lot of them will often even, they'll actually get mad at you. If you, if you uh, what do you mean he didn't die for everybody on the cross, you see? Well, there again, um, he didn't. See, the, the, uh, you've probably, we've talked about this before, but it's important. Um, the Arminian view of the cross is that Christ died on the cross and paid for the sins of everybody, all right? He paid for the sins of everybody. And now it's, uh, the ball is in the sinner's court. They have to choose to believe Christ. Therefore, it's, they claim that they have the ability then to, to choose Christ. And then, um, uh, so, but in fact, if all Jesus did on the cross was to, um, what do I want to say? Well, under the Arminian view of the cross, nobody would be saved. Because he, Christ accomplished nothing on the cross. And that theoretically, nobody could choose. In fact, in fact, because of total depravity and the sinner being dead in their sins, no one would choose Christ. No, no one, no one would. Because they couldn't, because they won't. They, 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 and so, um, at any rate, you see, th- so those are, those are the problems. But that, that kind of a view, that Arminianism, will come through. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we see it in some other parts of the book. But, but there it is, especially there in, uh, in, chapter, in chapter 4. So, so let's uh, keep that in mind. And don't, you know, don't give in to this ecumenical pressure this business of uh, being so accepting of, of Rome, all right? Rome, Rome is the Antichrist masterpiece in, in many ways. Uh, uh, you in the back there, this Max, Max is going to expound. <laughs> I'll try to remember to say what he said. Oh, wait a minute. Verla, could you hand this to, to Mac? We're gonna, we'll do a little switching and hand him the microphone. There you go. Someday we'll get that hand Okay. Here you go. Well, years ago when I was involved with Men for Christ, I remember going through uh, periods of trying to understand, uh, reconciling some of the things that we were hearing uh, through that ministry and the, and the scriptures. So it was a difficult time for me. Ultimately, I came to a point where I saw the fallacy of it and I pulled out. But remember, uh, that Men for Christ ministry was very much a ECT ministry, evangelicals and Catholics together. Uh, yeah. And we tried for a while to get Randy Alcorn to come to speak to one of our Men for Christ uh, meetings. And he was never able to do it because he had conflicting things, you know. But I'm reminded of that now and reading some of these things that I'm reading now versus I, too, read the book before. And there were some troubling things that I saw then, I remember. But... Uh, this is pernicious because it took, I struggled with it myself uh, with that ECT and all of this stuff. And I thought, well, this isn't biblical. Eventually, of course, I came out of Men for Christ for that reason. So it was there, was, there was a red flag for me, I'm just saying, clear back then. And it was part of my journey to see truth and, and then reconcile truth of the scriptures with some of these so-called ministries like ECT and Men for Christ and Randy Alcorn and others, well, like and Swindoll. Billy Graham. Billy Graham. Swindoll was another one that was ECT. Yeah. 
And, you know, there were times I used to listen to Swindoll on the radio. And, and there was constant confusion going on because it didn't match up with Scripture. So it was a process. So this is a pernicious lie from the pit that Christians have to really be careful about and, and go to the Scriptures and see what Scriptures say. And then, like you said, ask God, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. All right, yeah, good observations there. You know, yeah, you know, I mean, if you want to get people upset, even though that's not your purpose, but uh, then just, you know, be, be critical in your standard evangelical circles of Billy Graham. Billy Graham mixed it up with Rome terribly. That, you know, uh, I remember, you know, Lloyd-Jones in uh, England, when Billy Graham was coming there for a crusade, he uh, asked uh, the pastors, including Lloyd-Jones, to um, support the crusade and so forth. And Lloyd-Jones' response was to him was, well, if you stop having these uh, Roman Catholic and Church of England high officials who don't believe the gospel, who don't believe uh, in the inerrancy of Scripture and so forth, you stop having them on the platform with you, well, then maybe I'll consider it, but, but Graham wouldn't. He wouldn't because he wanted to be ecumenical and have these, these crowds, you see. But, but see how you can get swept up in that. I mean, it's like, oh, wow, look at all the people coming forward, the Billy Graham crusades, and man, this is a great, this is a great thing. And then if, if you're at all critical or you say, well, well, no, let's hold on a minute here. Um, and there's some problems with this, well, then you're just, you're the troublemaker, see? And I'm sure that's what happened with Calvin and Luther and the Reformers. When they were pointing out these errors and this false gospel, they were accused of being just troublemakers and divisive people and, and, and so forth. So anyway, all right. So as you read, read with discernment. And, uh, and we should always be doing that then, um, uh, anyway, so uh, the subject is uh, this. There we go. The subject of uh, heaven, though, is a very important one, and this is something that we should be are able to be greatly then in, encouraged encouraged by. Um, so I'm delving into uh, chapter two here, looking for some spots that I that I circled here, and, um, uh, you know, he, he deals with some, some good questions. If, if the Bible says, as it does in, uh, where is it, 1 Corinthians, then uh, um, no eye has seen, nor ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him, then how can you talk about heaven? You know, that's what some people will say. It, it's so far beyond what we, can what we can know that there's no point in even um, really thinking about it. But of course, the, that, that where Paul is, what Paul is emphasizing to us there is, is the glories of heaven. And that um, uh, we cannot fully comprehend. Maybe we can't even hardly even make a start, just a little start, at comprehending what the glories of heaven will be in the new heavens and, and the new earth, all right? Uh, but the Bible gives us all kinds of tangible uh, pictures of heaven. I also should note here, and if you've read very far in the book, you've come across this, he, he, he makes a good distinction here in this point. When we talk about heaven, there's two aspects to it. There's the temporary heaven, and then there's the permanent heaven, the new heavens and the new earth. By the temporary heaven, what he means is, what the Bible means is, uh, they called the intermediate state. When, when you die right now, a Christian dies right now, we go to heaven, all right? But that's not the permanent heaven. 
And we know that because in Revelation, the saints are like, Lord, how long, how long? And they're gonna, when are you going to judge this world and the world, earth will be renovated? As Peter says, melt, the elements will melt and so on. And, and Christ will bring in the new Jerusalem, a picture of, of the new heavens and earth will descend and, and God will dwell among men and, and, uh, and all of those things. So the Bible gives us all kinds of pictures uh, of, of uh, the eternal heaven, right? Which we'll call the new heavens and new earth, the new, new creation. Uh, a city, there's a picture of that. But I think the, uh, the, the best, what, what, what would you say is the clearest picture of the new earth given to us in the Bible? Yeah, there you go. See, it's, it's Eden. Yeah. Now, think about this. What, what was Eden? Was it a vapory, spiritual, what, ghostly? No, Eden is, was this earth before it fell, and there was trees and animals and, and people with real bodies, there was no sin, there was God tabernacling permanently among men, walking with men in the garden, and, and it was, uh, there was, what else was there there? There's rivers, there was rivers there, um, it's a, a tangible place. Now just think about it, if God created originally the earth and the creation for man and for God's glory, and it was like that, why shouldn't we conclude that the new earth will be any different except better? Because there won't be any possibility of sin. And sure enough, when you read Revelation, all these images from Eden start cropping up again, right? And uh, only this, this time around, the, the serpent's not, the serpent's not, uh, not there. So there are all kinds of, of uh, sections of scripture that do enable us to know about the the new creation, about about uh, about heaven. So um, now he does say, let me show you here. Um, oh, I pulled up I pulled up this Second Peter verse about the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar. Heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are to be thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and, and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, Heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. The reason I, I was looking at that scripture uh, this morning was uh, uh, our son, Kenny, he, uh, he texted me this morning and he asked me if the Bible had anything to say about nuclear war, you know. Now, now, only, only a fool would not be thinking about these things right now. I mean, we, we all, I think everybody who has a brain, a Christian or not, is, is very anxious. People are very anxious and, and worried because of the things going on in the world, the things going on in our nation. And, and so forth. And anyway, so he was asking me about, because he, he said he was thinking about his kids and, you know, what, what kind of a world are they going to have to live in and, and uh, as sin is increasing and, and then here's this fear of you know, all these crazy, power-hungry People have nuclear weapons, you know, at, at their disposal. What, what about it? Well, the earth and the elements are going to melt, <laughs> right? But the, 
this present world is not going to end in nuclear war. Now, that doesn't mean there couldn't be some, some nuclear stuff set off and so forth, but the world and mankind is not going to end that way. This is how it's going to end. Christ, and this is why people, uh, you want to fear somebody? Don't fear Putin. Fear Christ. You know, he, he's the one that, that is, is coming. And, uh, but if we, if we know him, then we don't need to be anxious. He said, look it, there's going to be wars and rumors of wars, okay? Earthquakes and all, all this stuff is going to happen. But he tells them, don't be anxious. This stuff, I've got this in hand. I'm sovereign. And uh, you just, you seek my kingdom and my righteousness. And don't, you don't need to be anxious about this stuff here, okay? So that's a... Uh, Anyway, that's why I was I was pulling that one, pulling that one up. Um, so where was I going to look? I flipped the page here. I think. Um, oh yeah, Colossians three. Here we go. Um, let's see, Bible books, Colossians three, in verse one. So he commented and had some good comments here about setting our hearts and minds on heaven. To long for Christ is to long for heaven, because that's where we'll be with him. God's people, Hebrews 11, are longing for a better country, right? That's a, you, they, Hebrews was using Abraham particularly as an example there. Longing for a better country. This world is not the Christian's home. We're looking forward to that city with foundations whose builder and maker is God, right? That's what we're, we're looking for. So, and, and, and Abraham then knew that. So this is something that we need to maybe plaster on the refrigerator at home, you know, like, right? If then you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind, there it is. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth, for you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ. It's, it's hidden right now. But what we are going to be, and the new creation that Christ is making for us, it's going to be revealed. When Christ who is your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Christ is our life. Now, it's easy to read those verses, but then Monday morning rolls around, and, uh, you know, we have to work at this, and we have to pray about this, that the Lord... Help me keep my mind on things that are above. Because that's where your real life is. That's where your real life is. That's where it's going to begin. In part, in part, the Christian in this world um, is participating now in our new life in, in Christ. But not fully. Not, not fully. Our real home is is yet is yet to be seen so um, probably how much how much time do you suppose we spend every day setting our minds on things on this earth right I mean it they, they just beckon us all the time all the time things that have to be have to be taken care of and so forth. So, I mean, you can have, you know, like happened to us last January. It's like, it's like it's stupid rats chewed to the water line. You had to crawl under the house and fix the leaks and, and, uh, and all of that stuff. And then it just, just that stuff kind of can, can consume you, you know. What about, what about the stock market? What about the finances? What about, you know, all this stuff? I saw a 
You guys ever watch that program, 48 Hours? It's on uh, YouTube, and it, it's all about, usually it's about a, a murder mystery and how they're trying to find out who, who murdered somebody. And uh, anyway, there's this guy, and he, he had millions of dollars, and his wife, and they bought this huge deluxe horse ranch where they were training horses for the Olympics in, in, uh, in Florida, and I mean everything is going and like real quick back in 2008 I guess the economy crashed in 2008 my finances didn't change I guess if you don't have much money you don't have to worry I don't know but anyway it crashed and he lost them they lost the money I mean like that before it was over I mean, before it was over, they lost their whole place, whatever. They relocated to the Midwest and, and uh, were having to do landscaping. Anyway, she ended up shooting and killing him. And then, and then she, but she got convicted of it and is in, so he's dead and she's in prison for the rest of her life, you see. But their, their, their minds were just sat on the stuff of this world and then it's gone. Is gone just like that. So this this world this world is toast, and it's not going to last forever. So let's let's focus on on the things that are above. All right. Now, chapter three, he did. I'd say quite a, a good job in in this sense. He didn't pull any punches about hell, right? He he took a look at at scripture. On this, and uh, and he said things like, "I'm on pay, I'm on the first page of chapter three, about midway down." He said, uh, talking about sin, heaven is not our default destination. No one goes there automatically, unless our sin problem is resolved. The only place we will go is our true default destination, hell. I'm addressing this issue now uh, because through this book I will talk about being with Jesus in heaven, being reunited with family and friends, and enjoying the great adventures in heaven. The great danger is that readers will assume they're headed for heaven. So here, here he gets specific here. He doesn't always do that, but here he does, and he's clear here. Now look at this. I mean, this is true, right? Judging by what's said at most funerals, You'd think nearly everybody's going to heaven, right? Uh, Jesus made it clear that most people are not going to heaven. That's a good statement. And it's a biblical statement. Jesus made it clear. Most people are going to hell, right? Small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life. And only a few find it, right? Right? Only a few find it. I think, um, I think that so many local churches, preachers, professing Christians really want to, they want to ignore that last little part. They want to, you know, only a few, only a few find it. But Jesus is the one, Jesus is the one that said it. Oh, the first line, by the way, in this chapter is, there was some study he looked at anyway. For every American who believes he's going to hell, there are 120 who believe they're going to heaven. I'd probably raise that number. I'd probably raise that number, you know, that, uh, that heaven seems to be people's default, um, default destination. All right, um, page 24, under the heading hell, Heaven's awful alternative. He says, Hell will be inhabited by people who haven't received God's gift of redemption in Christ. All right, that's a little bit of a weak statement, but anyway. After Christ's return. Oh, and by the way, let's look at that one. You know, Revelation, I mean, that book, that book nails it, doesn't it? Um, Revelation, what do you say, 20 there? Uh, verses 12 to 15. Yeah, here we go. 
And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. You know, um, in the Lamb's book of life, then that's the elect, it's the redeemed. But the rest are judged by their works. If God judges you by your works, you're toast, right? That's it. So um, the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. Why that language? Why is he emphasizing the sea gave up the dead, death and Hades gave, you know, Hades is kind of a, Hades is kind of a uh, holding place for the wicked until the judgment, remember the rich man and Lazarus and so forth. But why is he emphasizing this? The sea gave up the dead. It's because this judgment is bodily. In other words, Christ's people will be bodily resurrected, right? And our, our, new, our new bodies. The wicked are going to be resurrected. And this tells us what? Hell is also a real place. It's also a real place. So they were judged, each one of them, according to what they'd done. Death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. It's where Satan ends up. This is the second death the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Okay? So, remember now, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is Christ revealing these things to John. So these are the words of, of, of Christ, you see. Um, he goes on here, after Christ returns, there will be a resurrection of believers for eternal life in heaven and a resurrection of unbelievers for eternal existence in hell. Now, just to emphasize that these are Jesus' words here. John 5, <clears throat> 28 here. He's going to say, he quotes later on, and it is correct that um, the person in Scripture that spoke the most about hell was Jesus. Right, So, verse 28, Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice. All. All who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life. Now, of course, doing good means believing in Christ. All right? That's what it, it's, not, it's not teaching I'm, Rome probably jumps on that verse there, you know, and say, but anyway, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. So, so there it is. The unsaved, um, let's see, yeah, the unsaved, everyone whose name was not written in the Lamb's book of life will be judged by God according to the works they've done, which have been recorded in heaven's books. And because those works include sin, people on their own without Christ cannot enter the presence of a holy God and will be consigned to a place of everlasting destruction. Christ will say to those who are not covered by his blood, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his, and his angels. You know... Unless you have been given the gift of faith and been born again by God's doing, um, you're going to have trouble believing that. You're going to have, uh, because, I mean, even now, let, let's face it, I mean, none of us rejoice in that. Oh, good, you know. Well, I mean, there might be some people where you'd say, oh, good, that that's where they're headed. But what's going to happen is when we are resurrected and glorified and for the first time in our lives thinking straight, absolutely straight, what's going to happen is God is not only going to be praised eternally for his glorious grace, 
he's going to be praised by us for his glorious justice. Justice. That's why, now think about it. We know from earlier parts of Revelation that the saints in heaven are praying. They're praying that God, you know, how long, O oh Lord? He's, they're praying for him to come and judge the wicked, right? And uh, the mere fact that, that um, we can tend to, to waffle on this and not see the glories of God's justice yet shows that we've still got a ways to go in our, in our sanctification here, you see. Justice, we should, we should yearn for, for, God's, for God's justice then. What was it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you're probably going to hear a lot about 48-hour stories because I've been watching them. But anyway, um, how'd this work? This guy murdered his wife in an extreme... I get the episodes mixed up, too, but uh, in, in just a horribly wicked, evil way, exceptionally. And he was convicted by the jury. Right Then after that, uh, the prosecutor was going for the death penalty. And this, this was in Florida where they do carry out the death penalty. But um, then it has to go to the jury for another phase to determine whether he's going to get the death penalty or life. Okay. Now this is frustrating because, because it turned out they were, the jury was in deliberations for a long time. And finally, they came back, and their conclusion was he's going to get life and not the death penalty. And they interviewed the prosecutor later on, and he said, what, what happened? What happened? And, and he said, well, what happens is, unless all 12 unanimously agree, then in, he can't be given the death penalty. And guess what? It was 11 to 1. So here's one person, you know, see... There's this deficiency of uh, where is your yearning for justice here, right? And uh, but there was one, just one, one hold out there, and uh, so. Um, all right, on page twenty-five here, what did Jesus say about hell? Many books deny hell. That's true. Others teach, he says, universalism. Everybody's going to be saved in the end. Everybody's going to be saved because God is a God of mercy and love, and there's no way that he would send somebody to spend eternity then um, in hell. Those kind of people, sometimes I, I honestly think, I think sometimes they, they think that he's even... I'll bet you could find a book that teaches that in the end, God's going to have redeemed Satan himself. And Satan will be then in, in heaven. Um, but in the Bible, oh, I should read this. Um, some consider hell to be the invention of wild-eyed prophets obsessed with wrath. All right, And uh, they argue that Christians should take the higher road of Christ's love. It's not a higher road at all. But this perspective overlooks a conspicuous reality. In the Bible, Jesus says more than anyone else about hell. And he refers to it as a literal place. He describes it in graphic terms, including raging fires the worm, and the worm that doesn't die. Christ says the unsaved will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. In the story of the rich man and Lazarus, Jesus taught that in hell, the wicked suffer terribly, are fully conscious, retain their desires and memories and reasoning, long for relief, cannot be comforted, cannot leave their torment, and are bereft of hope. Now, um, by the way, a little P.S. here, later on somewhere in the book, he'll, he, deals, he will address some interesting and common questions. And one is, when we are in the new creation, in the new earth, we are glorified, we're with Christ, will we remember anything that happened? You know, and the answer would be, well, if we remember this stuff, 
then how can be we be really happy? Will we know that these people are, you know, and all those questions, and some of which we just have to say, we don't know. There comes a point where you just have to not go beyond Scripture. But uh, we'll do this in conclusion. Luke 16 here. This, this tells us a lot. Um, Luke 16, and we've looked at this before. This is the account, starting in verse 19, of the rich man and Lazarus, okay? The rich man and Lazarus account, told by Jesus, is, is, it, this is an incredible stuff here, when you really think about it. Jesus is opening the, the window and, and giving us a peek into what happens when we die. Now, here again, this is uh, the temporal state, the intermediate state, okay? So now, so I'm, I'm going to just skip down here. The poor man was die, died and was carried by angels to Abraham's side, right? A great angelic throng and welcoming him. The rich man also died and was thrown in a hole, right? That's how, and was buried. That's how it looked. And in Hades... Being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. Now, what does that verse 23 tell you about right now when the wicked die? Okay, we'll just look at the wicked. But what does that tell you about him? He's in torment, obviously, in Hades. Um, but what else do you see? Sometimes the obvious kind of can, we can skip by it, but what else is true about this guy? He could see heaven. He could see, what could he see? He could see that Lazarus was there to be reward. Yeah. And he, he sees Abraham, he sees Lazarus, far off, and, and they're in, I guess we'd call that paradise or whatever right, right now, but where believers go, the intermediate state. But he recognizes them. He, rec he recognizes Lazarus. Furthermore, um, Abraham, and I assume Lazarus, they recognized him. They recognized him. What does that tell us? There's got to be, there's some continuity there. There's got to be some, you know, does God give us temporary intermediate bodies? You know, when, when Samuel showed up to Saul and they, oh, they recognized him, it's Samuel. Or Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, he's talking to uh, Moses and Elijah. Right? It, I mean, they're identified. So, <clears throat> so we, we know this, that, that um, we have our identity there and some kind, of, some kind of body, something, which has to resemble. I mean, he, he knew who Lazarus was. He knew. Uh, he recognized him, and they recognized him. And so you see him, we're told this in kind of physical terms. Have, well, had, send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue. You know, what, does that mean that Lazarus had fingers? You see, I mean, it's presented to us as if all these people have bodies, Still, and yet we know it's not the glorified body, the resurrection body. Now, regarding what can we remember, well, Abraham says, child, to the rich man, remember, you in your lifetime received your good things and Lazarus in like manner bad things. So he, he Lazarus, and, or, um, the, and the rich man and Abraham, they had the ability to remember events in their earthly life, see? 
So um, there's a, at least an indication there that there is that is that remembrance then. Um, and uh, so anyway, and he knows he know, the rich the, the rich man knows he he has five brothers, He's gonna send them back and and warn them. So he he remembers he remembers then uh, all of that. Uh, one of the old Puritans I was reading on the doctrine of hell said, one of the things that will torment the wicked in hell for all eternity is that they will have a memory of how many times they just trampled underfoot the blood of Christ and rejected the gospel and wasted away their life on any, all these opportunities that they had, you see. And they'll remember that and remember it and remember it then, uh, then forever. So, all right. Well, he goes on to ask us, is, is it unloving to speak of hell? And, of course, then it's not. Um, and he mentions Second Thessalonians 1 and some other scriptures that talk about the everlasting destruction than um, in hell. And he mentioned also that, you know, the world <clears throat> gives all these notions about hell, right? Well, I'll see you in hell. Me and my buddies, you know, we'll be down there and we'll be doing all this. And he emphasized, most likely, each person is in solitary confinement, just as the rich man is portrayed being alone in hell. Misery loves company, but there will be nothing to love in hell. And so, and so there it is. So that was all in all, yes, a, a, a good chapter. And uh, we won't spend much time on, on uh, the next chapter, but I mean, go ahead and read it. We can know that we're, we're going to heaven. We can have assurance of that. And then he'll talk about in chapter five, what is the nature of the present heaven? And he'll talk some more about the intermediate state there. So, Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for Christ. Thank you for, for calling us out of darkness and into the light of your Son. Thank you that Christ is coming again, and we pray that he would come very soon. We pray that you would remind us by your spirit and word to set our minds on things above, and to not be anxious about things in this present world, knowing that this is not our real home. And the day is coming soon when we will see it and be with you face to face. And thank you for all of this in Christ's name. Amen.